Psalm 2 and Psalm 2 in Romans chapter 1 this morning. Psalm 2 in Romans chapter 1. We're going to start in Psalm 2, but first we'll start in prayer, so let's pray. Our God and our Father, I thank you again for this day. I thank you, Lord, that you have blessed us with the nice weather. I thank you, Lord, that you have blessed us with grass that is green and trees that are blooming and flowers that are showing their colors. And as we look around, all around us outside, and we see the creation that you have done, and realize that it could only happen because of you. Never could have happened because of chance and randomness. But all is there because you are the creator and you are an orderly God. God, I thank you that you are an orderly God. Because so much in this world, because of people, is chaotic right now. And God, I thank you that you have provided a solution for all of that. And that is your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray for this country. I pray for this world. Because it is so dark. And so many have, have turned from you, Lord. And the only thing that is going to, to draw them to you is your word your living word, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would open our ears and our hearts to hear your word and to follow your word, not just today, but every day. Pray that we would remember that you are our hope and our refuge. God, I pray that we would share that glorious good news with others, that Jesus Christ died for their sins, was buried, and that he arose from the dead on the third day, and that he is, is alive and at your right hand in heaven. What glorious news that is, and such a wonderful message to share. And these things I do pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. All right, so Psalm 2, Psalm 2, verse 1. Psalm 2, verse 1. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Disciples of Jesus Christ, we are in the midst of a great spiritual battle in this world today. As the days are getting closer and closer to the return of Jesus Christ, it seems like the evil in this world is expanding and no longer content to remain in darkness. Sin has less and less restraint on it as people are quickly losing their feelings of shame and guilt, and it looks like God is giving people more people up so they can follow their vile affections, and they become vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts are darkened. Citizens of this world are angry, and they are confused, and they want nothing to do with God. They think they can stand against the Lord God of heaven even as they deny his very existence and they believe that they are the preeminent ones in this world. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Because they have rejected Jesus Christ. They may claim to have belief in God, but they want nothing to do with Jesus Christ. Or they choose to create an idol that they proclaim is the embodiment of Jesus Christ. A Jesus Christ that is acceptable to them. That unconditionally loves them and accepts and excuses their sins and their rebellion. 
And we see from the first three verses of the second psalm that the people, the heathen, are united against the king. I'm sorry. The heathen are united with the kings of this earth. The leadership in their rebellion against God. The people and the kings and the rulers have found a uniting cause. Their hatred of God and his anointed one. And it is a vain thing. It is a worthless cause doomed to fail because who can overthrow the creator of everything? And we see that played out in the events of the world. People are scheming against God, but their plans are so very obvious. However, the citizens of this world fail to see that, and like a herd of goats, they go along with their plans. Their thinking has gone astray, and even though they may appear to win for a while, in the end, everything they are doing and scheming will come to nothing. Nobody can defeat the Almighty God. Everything exists because he allows it or causes it. As the Lord declared to Job in Job 38, where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? God has always existed, and he knows everything, and he knows the blackness of men's hearts. He was the one that created the foundation. He knows the size of it, he created it to be just the right size, put it in just the right spot. But men will still struggle against him, and they will always, in the end, lose. These sinful, rebellious heathen, people, kings, and rulers are convinced that they have been shackled by God, and they are determined to make themselves free. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us, they say in Psalm 2. What they fail to understand is that they are prisoners, but they have willingly made themselves prisoners. They are imprisoned not by God, but by their own sin and in bondage to the lusts of the flesh and the lusts of the eyes and the pride of life. They seek to please themselves and make themselves happy. They are bond servants to the idols in their lives, and they desire to please their addictions and their quest for power, acceptance, respect, love, and personal pride. And as their minds become more and more darkened, Jesus Christ states that in Luke chapter 12, verse 53, the father shall be divided against the son, and the son against the father, the mother against the daughter, and the daughter against the mother, the mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. The very people that should be closest will turn on one another as these days get ever closer to the end. Why? Because those that have rejected Jesus Christ will hate those that follow Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter 12, verses 51 and 52, Jesus Christ stated, Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth? I tell you, nay, but rather division. For from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two and two against three. And so many will say, but God is love, and God wants to unite us. One day, he will. But there will be a day of separation first, a day of division. The division will be about Jesus Christ, and those that truly do believe on him will be hated by those that have turned from him. The disciples of Jesus Christ will be hated because of Jesus Christ. And therefore, they will also hate the Lord God. As Jesus Christ said in John chapter 15, He that hateth me, hateth my Father also. You can find plenty that will talk about God, 
but they want nothing to do with Jesus Christ. But if you don't have Jesus Christ, you don't have God. Now the apostles, Peter and John, had been imprisoned while preaching about Jesus Christ at the temple. And in Acts chapter 4, we see that they were released after being told to not preach about Jesus Christ anymore. And Peter and John returned to the Christians in Jerusalem and gave them their report. In Acts chapter 4, they end up quoting the opening part of, Acts, of Psalm 2. But Acts chapter 4, verse 24 reads, And when they had heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David hath said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together, for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. Psalm 2, verses 1 through 3 were enacted by Herod, Pilate, the Gentiles, and the people of Israel. And this passage in Acts chapter 4 shows us that the Gentiles are the heathen of Psalm 2, and the people are the Jews. Herod and Pilate were enemies, but after the trial of Jesus Christ, that brought them together for a common civil evil cause. And you will see this played out in the world today. Groups that you would never have pictured coming together will unite against a common cause, their hatred of Jesus Christ and his followers. Think about it. Feminists will rail against Christians but are strangely silent about Muslims who greatly oppress women. Black rights groups accept assistance from Planned Parenthood, even though Planned Parenthood's founder had a goal of diminishing and removing ethnic groups. Not just African Americans, but pretty much anybody that was not Caucasian. That's what Margaret Sanger wanted to remove, and, and <laughs> it's right in her writings. Anybody can see it, but they conveniently ignore that truth. Why is this happening? Because their foolish hearts have been darkened. They're going blind to what results their actions will bring because of their hatred of Jesus Christ. And how are disciples of Jesus Christ supposed to respond? With love. The love of Jesus Christ. Why would we do that? Especially if it may cost us our especially if it may cost us our lives or freedom, because Jesus Christ tells us to love our enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. In Proverbs 25, verses 21 and 22, Solomon wrote, If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty... Give him water to drink, for thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. Now, Solomon was referring to actual bread and water, but we have living water to offer to people, Jesus Christ. And he also tells us he is the bread of life. And people are hungry. They don't realize it. They don't want to believe it or accept it, but they're hungry for something more. And that's Jesus Christ. He is that bread of life. He is that living water that they need. Go read John chapter 7. And you'll see how he talks of being the living water. When people are thirsty, that's what they need. And so people instead are stumbling about and their, their minds are darkened because they keep rejecting Christ. 
but the hope is there. And Jesus Christ says, Come unto me. Come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He's not referring to heavy laden from physical labor, but in even worse labor, that deep spiritual labor, because they don't have Christ. He's saying, I'll give you rest from your sins. You would just come to me. Now, one example of loving your, na- of loving your enemies is this account. And, and uh, I read his, his autobiography, and it's wonderful. It's only like this big, you know, but it's well worth getting it if you can find it on, uh, online, which is all I got. All right. In the early days of World War II, Sergeant Jacob Daniel DeShazer was a crew member in the legendary Doolittle Raiders, a team of 80 brave military servicemen who volunteered to bomb Tokyo in retaliation for the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. The Shazer was among those captured by the Japanese army after bailing out of his plane over Japanese-occupied China. He spent 40 months in captivity, 34 months of it in solitary confinement, and was the victim of cruel torture and starvation. In his own words, the Shazer said, My hatred for the enemy nearly drove me crazy. My thoughts turned toward what I heard about Christianity changing hatred between human beings into real brotherly love, and I was gripped with a strange longing to examine the Christian's Bible to see if I could find the secret. I begged my captors to get a Bible for me. At last, in the month of May 1944, a guard brought me the book, but told me I could only have it for three weeks. I eagerly began to read its pages. Chapter after chapter gripped my heart. On June 8, 1944, the DeShazer confessed his sins and received the forgiveness and salvation promised him in God's word. Even though he remained in prison for more than a year, he was free from hatred, free to love. He wrote the following in a post-war tract, I was a prisoner of Japan. And he wrote, How my heart rejoiced in my newness of spiritual life, even though my body was suffering so terribly from the physical beatings and lack of food. But suddenly I discovered that God had given me new spiritual eyes, and that when I looked at the enemy officers and guards who had starved and beaten my companions and me so cruelly, I found my bitter hatred for them changed to loving pity. With his newfound faith, De Shazer was anxious to try out the principles which he had been studying in Scripture, particularly the command to love your enemies. One day, he was particularly mistreated by a cruel guard. He decided that the next morning, he would greet that guard without bitterness and say, Good morning, in Japanese. God gave the Deshazer the grace to continue with that new treatment. And after a week, the guard, who had been so mean, actually gave him extra food. Deshazer was grateful and decided that God's way really worked. Physical freedom came for DeShazer and other prisoners of war on August 20th, 1945. Returning to his home in Oregon, DeShazer began, began seminary training shortly thereafter at Seattle Pacific College. He married and returned to Japan as a missionary. He served with his family as free Methodist missionaries in Japan for 30 years, planting 23 churches. Many thousands of Japanese responded to this former POW's invitation to believe on Christ as Lord and Savior. And in fact, one man that received his track was one of the lead pilots on the attack on Pearl Harbor as well. And he wrote a book as well about um, his salvation story and everything. Another good book to find. I got them both at the same time. Well worth the time to read. And therein is the solution. People need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
repent of their sins, and believe on Jesus Christ. That is how you can definitely love your enemies, by praying for them and giving them the gospel. How Jesus Christ has always existed, and before the foundation of the world was ever laid, God determined that he would send his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to leave the glories of heaven and walk on this earth for 33 years. During that time, Jesus Christ always, he always did his Father's will, and he never once broke any of God's laws. Jesus Christ was unlawfully tried and convicted for blasphemy by the Jews and turned over to Pontius Pilate. He then followed the angry mob's demand that Jesus Christ be crucified, even though Pilate had determined that Jesus Christ had done no wrong. In accordance to the scriptures, Jesus Christ was sacrificed on the cross to pay the penalty of death that each of our sins had accumulated and the righteous wrath of God afflicted him. Jesus Christ was then buried, and on the third day, Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead. Forty days later, he ascended to heaven and is now seated at the right hand of God. People are condemned and guilty because of their sins, and they are on their way to the eternal lake of fire unless they repent and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the good news we have to share with the world. Are you ready and able to share the gospel at any time? Daniel March wrote, If you cannot speak like angels, if you cannot preach like Paul, you can tell the love of Jesus. You can say he died for all. If you cannot rouse the wicked with the judgment's dread alarms, you can lead the little children to the Savior's waiting arms. Keep your finger in Psalm 2, but go over now to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, and drop down to verse 16. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. A disciple of Jesus Christ must never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he tells you that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. It is in the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that God's righteousness is revealed to those that will believe. God's word is what will change people's lives, not programs, not amazing personalities, not light shows and large productions, not worldly music, none of that. Faith comes by hearing and obeying God's word. God's righteousness is shown for all to see when the creator of all the universe is willing to take a poor, lowly, wretched sinner like me and save me from the horrible pit and the miry clay of my sin, and set my feet upon the rock that is Jesus Christ, who washes me in his own blood and cleanses me from every sin. People's thinking today is wrong and wretched because they are the children of disobedience and looking to serve themselves rather than humble themselves before the thrice holy God. They love the creation more than the creator. And that's why he says he's willing to show his righteousness to us. It is revealed. He was willing to wash me up. He was willing to wash each of you up. He was willing to clean you from your sins and make you new, make you a new creature. 
And he's willing to do that with anyone. If he's willing to do it with the vile king, King Manasseh, in the Old Testament, who was described as being the most wicked king, he's willing to do it for anyone. That's good news for people. That's good news that we have to share. But sadly, so many, they do love the creation more than the creator. Go on to verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. Now Paul was ready to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Romans, and he was not ashamed to declare the gospel and was not concerned about the potential consequences of preaching. It is because he cared for these people that were against God, that hated Jesus Christ, and Paul loved them anyway. Paul knew the wrath of God was upon them, and he greatly desired to see people be born again. These people knew the truth, but they twisted it and denied it and held it in unrighteousness, loving their sin in themselves more than anything else. And it's again, it's almost that picture, at least in my mind, of where the truth, they're just holding it, and they're grasping it like, like a, a baby will hold a teddy bear. They're holding on to that, and you cannot get away from them. They don't want to let it go because they do love their sin. They don't want to let go of their sin. And in some ways, they become dependent upon their sin. And they think, well, what will I do if I don't have this? Or if I can't take that? Or if I can't drink this? Or if I can't do that? Or if I can't watch that? Or I can't listen to that? And they think, I won't have anything. I won't be who I am. But if they would let it go and come to Christ, they'll find a peace that, was out, that is beyond understanding, a peace that passes everything, a hope of a better day, because one day we'll be with Christ in heaven. They'll have so much more, but they don't want to give it up. They don't want to give it up. First Corinthians chapter 6, And such were some of you that loved your sin, but you, and you held on to it. But one day you gave it up. It was my case. One day I realized what my sin was and how black my sin was. And I asked God to forgive me of it, and I repented of it, and I trusted in Jesus Christ to pay it. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Because that had been you at one time, you must now go out and tell others the gospel of Jesus Christ because you love Jesus Christ and you must love your neighbors. It is only the gospel of Jesus Christ that is going to change people's lives. It will wake them up, and show them that they are condemned and on their way to eternal separation from God in hell. They will hopefully respond and repent and believe, or they will perish without Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. In other words, we can look at creation and see what God has done. You, know, you can't see wind, but you can see the effects of wind. That's the invisible things, if you will, in a way. You know, God created everything. When you think about how intricate an eye is, how a bird's feet don't get cold in the winter, you know, how, how everything was formed. It only happened because of Creator. Verse 21, Because that, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, 
and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. The knowledge that there is a God is in everyone, for God has placed it in everyone. Sadly, many repress that truth and choose to turn the shoulder away from God. They reject God and determine to follow idols of their own making. Their idols end up being corruptible man or birds or animals or insects. Furthermore, this idolatrous man will mix man and animals together to create their idol, often an ugly, horrifying idol, which actually shows the wickedness and deceitfulness of their hearts. You know, and it's amazing as I look at people, especially this time of year when there's less clothing and they have no sleeves on their shirts and how many tattoos have, have horror movie productions on it and uh, scary monsters and snakes and skulls and daggers and blood. and It just astounds me. But it's showing the blackness of their hearts. What is on the inside manifests eventually itself on the outside. They glorify their idols and lift them up and carry them around and care for them. They show much more attention to the idols than to Jesus Christ because their idols are with the their hearts are with the idols rather than Jesus Christ. And why does this happen? Because they choose to not be thankful to God. They were not grateful that God chose to give them their next breath. They were not grateful that God allowed them to live another day. They did not thank God for where they are, or for what they have, and for what awaits them in the future. They did not thank God for not giving them exactly what they do deserve because of his grace and mercy. Their imaginations have become vain, thinking on light, fluffy, substanceless, substanceless things rather than meditating on the spiritual things of Jesus Christ. And they seek to only fill the lusts of their flesh and the lusts of their eyes and their pride of life, because it is all about them, them, them. Their thinking is broken because their foolish lost heart is darkened. A fool is one that says there is no God, and a foolish heart bears that out. Sadly, they think they are wise and smarter than God. They desire to give God counsel and tell him what to do, and that is foolishness and vanity, and they do not glorify God. The Lord and only the Lord is to be glorified. There is no other God. People choose to follow and worship idols, which can be statues, but also can be animals, pets, relatives, children, grandchildren, parents, entertainment and sports figures, pretty much anything or anyone that is placed ahead of Jesus Christ in your thoughts and heart. You are to worship the Lord your God in spirit and in truth. But there are those that make statues to worship in images of what they believe Jesus Christ looked like. Worship of Jesus Christ must be spiritual worship and not worship that relies on sights or seeing images transmitted upon a TV screen or a movie screen or a cell phone. If you have to walk by sight, then you are not walking by faith. If you rely upon a movie or a TV Jesus Christ to build your faith, then you have no faith. It is nothing but shifting sand. But I know of those that will say, well, I need to watch The Passion of the Christ and I watch when he's being beaten and when he's being crucified, and I think on those things. You know what? I can read it in this word and get a much better picture of it in his word, and that's sufficient. That's enough. If you choose to look, at, look to him as a creature and think you are respecting him, you are not doing anything but dishonoring him. People's eyes are not where they must be, and it is because they have not believed the gospel of Jesus Christ. People's faith is not where it must be, 
and it is because they have not trusted truly on the one that died for them, the holy giving up his life for the unholy. Are you ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? This world is full of confusion, corruption, and compromise. The gospel of Jesus Christ is simple so that all can understand it. The gospel of Jesus Christ is pure and holy because Jesus Christ is pure and holy. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the truth and allows for no compromise. And that's the message we have to share. Because people are hurting out there. People are, are looking for things to do and things to believe on. They're trusting in organizations and in people but they will all fail in the end. You look at some of the things that are happening in this country right now. You look at, for just a quick example, what's happening in Seattle, where they've set up a, a little city state within the middle of Seattle. And these are the very same people that said, walls are bad. And yet they've put up walls around their area as well as around their their garden they have said that police are bad and yet they have a warlord enforcing things there what we're seeing that they have ideas that are great in their minds but they're not workable god is a god of order and of justice and of righteousness and if people would only see that, what a difference it would be. Can you imagine if everyone did come to Christ, what a world this would be like? I realize it won't happen because the Bible says it won't happen yet. But even if we tell one person, let them know Jesus Christ died for them, it makes a difference. It's like that... The, the story of the boy that's on the beach and there's all these starfish that have washed ashore. And the boy is picking up the starfish and he's throwing them back into the water. And somebody comes up to him and says, why are you throwing those starfish into the water? You know, most of them are, you know, most of them are going to die. But this one won't die as he throws yet another one into the water. You know, I kind of beat that story up. But the idea is, we need to give them the gospel. Let them know about Christ and his great love for them. The true gospel, the truth that is in his word. That's what they need to hear today. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 tells us, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, again, I thank you for your word. Thank you, God, because it is your word that does change people's hearts. It is your word that changes them from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh, that unstiffens their necks and unhardens their hearts. And Lord, I thank you for your word because it did the same for me. And God, I pray that we would get your word out to others, that you would go before us and soften hearts and prepare them as we give them the word of God and we give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, there's so many out there that are hurting, so many that are, that are sad and sorrowful, so many that are angry. The solution to it all is Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that as we go through this week, we would be witnesses of you. 
that we would be salt and light to this world. We would show them that we are ministers to them. God, I pray, pray that, that you would just revive this country once more, bring salvation through this land once more before it's too late. And this I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen.